There are moments in every person's life when they face intense adversity. They're crucibles that forge who they become as individuals and as leaders. Now more than ever, we need leaders who are called to a higher standard, focused on leaving it better than they found it and paying it forward to the next generations. Now, let's join Fire Chief Randy Brugman as he speaks with leaders from all walks of life, as he explores and learns from their personal journeys and the crucibles that have forged them into better leaders and better people. Thanks for joining me on the Leadership Crucible today. I'm honored to have Gordon Graham join us today. Gordon has been actively involved in law enforcement since 1973. He's an attorney, consultant, lecturer, and author focusing on organizational and operational risk management issues. He has developed training systems and programs used by both public and private organizations around the world. His training program, Six Minutes for Safety, has been adopted by fire departments around North America and by all federal firefighting agencies and has been credited with reducing wildland firefighter injuries and deaths. His innovative safety systems, non-punitive close call reporting is receiving international acclaim from firefighting organizations and was the genesis for firefighternearmiss.com safety website. In 2005, Gordon received the prestigious presidential award from the International Association of Fire Chiefs for his lifelong work in improving firefighter safety and performance. In 2015, he received the Lifetime Dedication Award from the International Public Safety Leadership and Ethics Institute. In 2018, he received the James Oberstar Centennial for Safety Award for his lifetime work in improving aviation safety internationally. And in 2019, he received the Howard W. Rayon Distinguished Service Award. Gordon is the co-founder of Lexapol, a company designed to standardize policies, procedures, and training within public safety agencies around America. Please join me in welcoming Gordon Graham. Well, welcome, Gordon, to the Leadership Crucible. It's, uh, it's great to see you and to have you on the program. Thanks, Chief, for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. Me too. So, well, let's just jump into this. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do with this podcast is as experienced leaders, uh, bringing, bringing experienced leaders onto the show uh, and having them to share with the audience, you know, some of the things that they went through so that we can pay it forward to them uh, from s- some of the experiences that we've had. So uh, let me just start out with uh, asking you, have you ever sa- faced a situation where in your life that's really tested you uh, and really helped to shape who you've become as a person, as a leader, and maybe have a- actually even changed the course or the path that you took on your life, uh, in your life? Well, Randy, as you know, I'm a lawyer and I get paid by the hour, (laughs) so I will give you an in-depth answer. Okay, thank you. When I read the proposed questions that we're going to talk about today, that first question uh, on what tested me, and I reflected back, and I'm actually so grateful to you for making me reflect back on where I am today and how I got to where I am. Hmm. And so I'll digress for just a little bit. Okay. As I look at my life and all the things that have gone on, I was so fortunate. People today talk about privilege. I was so privileged to have a mom and a dad who raised me and they raised my sister and they raised my brother and everybody's very, very successful. My dad was a high school graduate. My mother was a high school graduate. My dad was a chief engineer, United States Merchant Marine, World War II driving bombs from the West Coast to Manila for the war effort. My mom, and you'll have to look this up if you're young, was a block warden, making sure the lights were all off at nighttime in San Francisco yeah. so we couldn't be bombed by the the enemy. And then they decided to have babies, and I came along in 1950, and I had a full-time mom. Dad worked multiple jobs so that mom could be at home. And also, my mother's mother lived with us. And my grandma... Uh, Uh, who was an orphan, uh, she had Parkinson's disease, so she couldn't write. So here I am, a young kid, and I would write all of grandma's letters. I'm like five or six years old, and she's dictating, and I'm writing letters. And my grandmother and my father were voracious readers. They were always reading something. 
and I can recall, and you forced me to think about this stuff. <laughs> my grandmother was reading Time and Life magazine way back then. And she was pointing out things. And she kept on saying this, this vet name is going to be nothing but a problem. This vet name is going to be nothing but a problem, later known as Vietnam. Vet name was hers. But she was calling that back in the 50s, that it was going to be a problem. And that's you know where I was raised, my mother and my father. I think my mother recognized early on in my life that I was shy. I don't know how my mother pulled this off. She enrolled me in the San Francisco Boys Chorus, hmm. which was a very elite group of singers. And somehow my mother got me into this group. And ultimately, I sang in the San Francisco Opera on a regular basis. So I had this ability to get in front of people and, and sing. I was shy, you know, and, but I was, I was able to do that. I went to the seminary for a year. I got kicked out of the seminary, St. Joseph Seminary. Uh, that's a long, long story, but 25 years later, major investigation about child abuse or child molestation going on at the seminary, and the kids who wouldn't put up with it, they kicked out, and <laughs> I had no idea that was going on, but you know, you learn things, and I enrolled in St. Ignatius High School. Somehow my mother pulled some strings and got me into St. Ignatius, which is the powerhouse high school. Governor Jerry Brown went there. It's the powerhouse. I had no business there. Uh, it was for the elite group. And it was a constant challenge because I took the bus to, to school. I didn't have a car. All the rich kids had cars. Uh, they didn't have to work a job. I worked in the bookstore to help pay the tuition for my school. And so there was this, throughout my early life, there was this, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it attitude. My parents just convinced me that I could do anything. And I don't want to bore people with this, but my mom and my dad would come to the opera and I would hear them talk after the performance. The entire San Francisco opera would have folded up, but for my work. I was the <laughs> only reason the opera was able to exist. You know, and they gave me that confidence to, to do stuff. And then San Francisco State, uh, this is a name from the past, S.I. Hayakawa. Mm -hmm. Remember Senator Hayakawa? Yeah. Well, he was the dean at San Francisco State. And the lines for registration were huge to get classes, but you could skip the lines if you were part of the registration committee. So I got on the registration committee and he was in charge of that. And I watched him work and he could do anything. It was, you know, you'll, if you recall, Vietnam was winding down and there was all the riots in San Francisco state and SI Hayakawa. I watched this man in action, no fear, no fear, a little tiny guy, but absolutely no fear of anything. And through a series of flukes, I ended up getting a job in high school and college at San, uh, Swenson's Ice Cream, Earl Swenson, another World War II veteran. And he learned how to make ice cream in the Navy. And he opened up an ice cream store uh, in 1949. And in 66, he hired me. And I, I ultimately ended up being the night manager at Swenson's Ice Cream Store. But he had these rules. Number one, the customer is always right. Rule number two. If the customer is ever wrong, reread rule number one. You know, it was that type of stuff. And so I grew up with these people who convinced me there's a right way to do business. I can recall my father building things. Measure twice, cut once. You know, you got to do this better, son. You got to get better at this. You know, it was always that challenge of getting better and better and better. And then through a series of flukes, I joined the California Highway Patrol. And on day one at the academy, 150 men, it was all men. It was right after Vietnam. Everybody was hiring cops. Men, you take a look to the man to your right. Take a look to the man to your left. One of you will not be here in 16 weeks. The CHP Academy had a 33% failure rate. And as advertised, a week, 16 weeks later, there was 100 of us left. And they sent us to all to the downtown. Excuse me, there's five CHP offices in metropolitan Los Angeles. And 20 of us went to each one of these offices. And they told us, two of you will not get off probation. Well, I knew I was going to get off probation. I was absolutely certain I was going to get off probation. Then I wanted to be a motorcycle cop. CHP Motorcycle School had a 70% failure rate for first-time attendees. 70%. I knew I could do that. I had this confidence that I could do that stuff. But as I looked at where I am, you know, I had a series of fortunate interactions with a great mom and dad, a grandmother, great Catholic school education, K1 through eight. So I was raised with this 
there's a right way to do things, getting things done right the first time. Yeah. We talked a little bit about um, the importance of making knowledge, the, uh, the knowledge of many, the, the knowledge of one. Uh, and you know our, our organizations, whether you're in you're in a bureaucracy in, in in the private sector or one in the public sector, we're often so siloed uh, that we're just not sharing information uh, that really can make a difference for the customers that we serve. What, what's your what, you know what's your take on that? Well, I've got a seven step approach. <laughs> of course, I do. <laughs> I've got a seven step approach. Number one, we need better investigations. I got involved with two dads back in 2010 whose sons were killed by cops. They're both Air Force veterans. I got involved with them. Uh, They use the phrase, my son was murdered by these police. Well, there's a big difference in my world between being murdered and being killed. Murder is the intentional act. Killing killed is, you know, they're dead, but probably not. They didn't do bad things on purpose. And, but they're angry dads. And so I used the Public Records Act and I got both of the investigations of the deaths and they were garbage. They were garbage. Absolutely terrible. I wouldn't even call them a report. It was so poorly written. And these two dads were both Air Force veterans and they said, why doesn't law enforcement use the NTSB approach when they use deadly force to investigate? Now, the National Transportation Safety Board when they investigate a plane crash or a train crash or a pipeline tragedy, you'll get a comprehensive investigation that gets well beyond the proximate cause of the tragedy and looks for the real problems lying in wait. You know, I'm not being rude here, just very blunt. We lost Kobe Bryant here two years ago in this helicopter tragedy. Had law enforcement done that investigation, the investigation would have read, yeah, the pilot flew into a hill and everybody died. Well, we knew that instantly. The NTBS, NTSB comes back. They took a look at they take a look at fatigue. They take a look at training. They take a look at maintenance. They drill down and identify all these problems lying in wait. We don't do that. Yeah, doctors, if they screw up, somebody else is first in. You know, <laughs> I'm off the hook. Yeah. So we need to learn from tragedies in other industries. Rule one of my seven better investigations. Rule two, learning from these investigations. Rule three, learning from tragedies and other high-risk professions. Rule four, the value of learning from close calls. My thesis in graduate school was on the mathematical relationship between close calls, mishaps, and tragedies. For those viewers here, if you're really into this, check out the work of H.W. Heinrich, H-E-I-N-R-I-C-H, a... um, worked for Travelers Insurance Company as an investigator. And he came up with this theory that's been validated so many times, his triangle of probability and round figures, when a group of people who do the same job have 300 errors, mistakes, one in 10, 30 and 300, will end up in some sort of a mishap. The sprain, the bruise, the rip, the fall, the cut, the impact, the property damage only event, one in 300 will end up in the big one death or great bodily injury. And currently we focus on learning from the deaths of the great bodily injuries. The better idea would be to learn from the mishaps because they're 30 times more frequent and they're much less severe. The best idea would be to learn from the close calls because they're much more frequent, 300 times more frequent with no severity at all. And my thesis in graduate school was non-punitive close call reporting. And I built it for CHP, motorcycles. Motorcycle cops should have the ability to come forward and talk to their commander without fear of discipline, without fear of embarrassment, and talk about their close call so the captain can share it with the group so everybody can learn from the close call. And I'm not being rude here. And the CHP was so good to me for so many years, but I was dismissed as a rambling nutburger. My captain at the time, stone cold idiot, stone cold idiot, he said, that's what happens when stupid people go to school. It was just devastating to me. I'm trying yeah. to fix things. And here I am accused of being stupid. I couldn't get any traction at all. So I'm doing a fire chief conference in Pennsylvania in 1998. And a firefighter comes up to be a fire chief. And he says, while you were talking about close calls, I almost vomited. I said, are you okay? He said, I almost got cut in half on a structure fire 10 years ago. 
I almost died. I miss dying by this much. And he said, I have never told anyone about it because what I was doing was so stupid. If I tell you what I did wrong, will you share with other firefighters? I will. Don't use my name. That's easy. I don't know your name. Don't even say my department name. Once again, I don't know where you work. Don't even say Pennsylvania, you know. And he told me this harrowing story about how he almost died. Well, he leaves. The next fire chief comes up, goofy looking guy, got this massive mustache. And he says, that was a pretty interesting story. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but it, I think it was confidential. He laughs. He's, well, he told you. <laughs> so I said, yeah. And he's, are you going to share that with other firefighters? And I said, I am. How many firefighters you talk to every year? I said, 1,000, 1,500 probably. Email was brand new back then, relatively yeah. new, 1998. He goes, I've got this thing called the secret list. He said, I've got 4,000 fire chiefs on my secret list. Write it up, redact it, take his name out, take his department name out. I'll send it out to 4,000 fire chiefs tonight. And I said, you and I need to have dinner. Yeah. And I went and had dinner with Chief Billy Goldfeder. And out of that dinner came firefightercloscalls.com, which is now recognized as an extremely beneficial website oh, yeah. for firefighters. Where firefighters today, Chief, from over 100 countries are talking about their close calls, you know, with complete anonymity. Nobody knows who they are. We redact out any information that could possibly identify them. And we have a huge viewership on this. The site got so popular that I assisted the International Association of Fire Chiefs in building their sister site, firefighternearmiss.com, an open forum where firefighters can talk about their mistakes without fear of discipline, without fear of embarrassment, so that others can learn. That's step four. Step one, better investigations. Step two, learning from investigations. Step three, learning from investigations in other high-risk industries. Step four, learning from close calls. Step five, downloading people before they leave. Hey, Mary, uh, Captain, understand you're leaving us at the end of the year. December 31st, sir. 32 years, I'm out of here. You know, you've had four jobs in the fire department. You've had four jobs in this police department. You were a firefighter. You were a paramedic. You were a paramedic supervisor. And then you ended up being a battalion chief. I want you to think back over your career. In each of those jobs you had, Mary, what were the three most important things you got involved in. How did you handle it? And how would you do it better if you ever encountered it again? Because that's the way smart people think. Number six, why don't we bring her back to help train, mentor, and develop the newest generation of supervisors? Mm -hmm. Bring her back. You know, I mentioned Sergeant Becker, the best sergeant in the history of the CHP, in my opinion, and he was my sergeant. He leaves. When is the next time the California Highway Patrol has contact with Sergeant Jack Becker? Funeral? All that institutional knowledge is sitting out there. Bring him back. Well, Gordon, we don't have a budget for that. My guess is if you called him and said, we need your help, he would come back happily. Is that good for him? Still being tied to the organization? Is that good for the profession? You know, you buy the guy lunch, he's going to come back and give us this institutional knowledge. I've been retired 16 years. And pre-COVID, Mrs. Graham and I would go out to dinner. Regularly, people would come up to dinner Excuse me, Gordon. Hey, Gordon Graham here. Uh, Gordon, you probably don't remember me. You were my first sergeant back in 1983. No, I don't remember you. We got 30 new cops every three months out of the, the academy. You know, 120 new cops a year. Nobody wanted to work in Central. 1,200 cops. He said, I didn't think you'd remember me, sir. But I was just telling my wife at dinner, that's Sergeant Graham. That's the best sergeant in the history of the Highway Patrol. Uh, I did the best I could, but we got some great sergeants out there. He says, no, sir. You were the only sergeant who used to regularly walk us out to our motorcycle at the end of the day and thank us for a good day's work. Seriously? Sir, I worked in three different CHP offices as a motorcycle cop. You were the only sergeant who ever did it, and you regularly did it. If that's true, that's a sad state of affairs. The number one complaint I get from employees around the world in every occupation, every profession, the only time I hear from my supervisor is when something's wrong. Our people do a heck of a lot more right than they do wrong. Catch your people doing something right and take the time to compliment them. I, what am I, a genius? I came up with this because I'm brilliant? No. Jack Becker, I had about a year on the job. Hey, Gordon, you get ready to head home? Yes, sir. 
let me walk you out to your motorcycle. Oh, on the way down the hallway, Gordon, I don't get the chance to thank you often enough. For what? For what? I just finished up your paperwork today, son. 27 citations, two felony arrests. Gordon, every time I see you sitting in briefing, I know I'm going to get a good day's work out of you, son. Now, you be careful on the way home. I'll see you tomorrow. And remember, you're an important part of afternoon shift. That is gold. That is gold. What do I vow on the way home? I'm going to work harder tomorrow. It costs you nothing to do that, and most people don't. You know, I would have never probably done it, but for Jack Becker setting the tone for these things, the institutional knowledge is out there. Bring these people back. So we've got the six, better investigations, learning from investigations, learning from investigations in other high-risk industries, learning from close calls, downloading the great people before they leave, bringing back the best of the best. So what are we going to do with all this? I want to put all of this into a learning management system where when people log on at the start of the day, the computer will know this is Mary Smith, this is John Smith with the job description of paramedic in a major city with the job description of deputy sheriff in the middle of nowhere. And there will be a training bulletin delivered to them specific to their type of operation. Because what a rural deputy sheriff needs to know is completely different than what a big city motorcycle cop needs to know. So does this concept transfer over to the private sector as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I made a big mistake in talking to Walmart a number of years ago, <laughs> and I gave them all this information. And then my financial advisor, who sort of gives me advice and everything, you gave them all that for free? You know, if I was a Walmart person, when you log on on your cash register, there'd be a training bulletin there. You know, pilots. You know, I flew, I flew last night. I came home from, uh, where was I yesterday? Mobile, Alabama. Twice I was trained on the way home. You know, right before takeoff, they're giving me training on a core critical task, an emergency on the takeoff roll. This idea will transfer to any operation. Every day we need to train, and not random training, but focus training on core critical tasks. Very risky, done very rarely, with no time to think. Yeah, yeah very, very true. Gordon, we were talking uh, previously about a, uh, a friend that uh, we shared, Chief Alan Brunsini from uh, the Phoenix Fire Department. And you were talking about that you had the opportunity to give him his send off at his funeral. Uh, you know, we lost Alan a couple of years ago, and you were talking about the dash that uh, we all live uh, in our per personal and professional lives. So I was hoping that you could share a little bit of perspective on uh, what you said that day and, and the importance that we as leaders and individuals should look, uh, look at when we think about the impact that we're making on uh, the people that we work for and, and our families. Well, my guess is, Chief, that a lot of the people who are viewing this are younger than you and I are. Yes. <laughs> and uh, my guess is that you've been invited to do eulogies. Uh, I get invited to do eulogies. I've got three eulogies scheduled for this year. People who know they're dying and they ask, Gordon, can you do my eulogy? So what do you say to that? No, I'm busy. <laughs> no, you know, you have to do these things. And I wanted a structure so that I would, you know, truly capture what this person was all about. And I came across Linda Ellison's great poem called The Dash. The Dash. Go to any cemetery, any place in the world. There's a date of birth and a date of death. In between them is The Dash. Mm -hmm. And her poem is very well written, very well written. She's strong on copyright, so I'm not going to repeat it to you, but you can look it up. What did you do during that window of time? And uh, so when you look at The Dash that Alan Bernasini left, that is significant, you know, and you know a lot more about fire service operations than I ever will. But I got to tell you, when the Wall Street Journal calls you and asks you a question about your profession, that tells you you've made a difference already. Yeah. <laughs> when, you know, people are quoting you on a regular basis, that means you're making a difference. And I met Alan Bernasini in the late 80s. And just a funny little aside, we're driving along in Phoenix. This is the chief of the Phoenix Fire Department probably the most highly respected fire chief in the country. He picks me up at the airport. Oh, I'm nobody. And we're driving along and there's a La Quinta hotel on our right. And he says, hey, Gordon, do you know what La Quinta means in Spanish? And I said, no. He goes, behind Denny's. Behind Denny's. And I laugh and that's sort of funny, you know, behind Denny's. So I did Alan Bernasini's funeral and I built it on the dash. 
all the accomplishments we had and how we changed the fire service around the world. But I wrapped up the eulogy with this. Ladies and gentlemen, you've all been to firefighter funerals before. At the funeral, they give you a card to remember this person. How many of you have the card with you today? That's right, nobody. They give you a coin to remember this person. How many of you know where the coin is right now? They give you a picture of this person. They give you this, they give you that. I said, you don't save that stuff. It's in some drawer buried and your grandkids will find them when they're cleaning out your house. I said, you want to remember Alan Bernasini? I said, every time you see a La Quinta, remember, it means behind Denny's and think of Alan Bernasini. And oddly enough, I get an email or a phone call. Yesterday, I was in Mobile, Alabama, talking to the Southeast Fire Chiefs Association. Two people came up to me and said, whenever I see a La Quinta, I think of Alan Bernasini. That's the best way to remember somebody, you know. So the eulogy thing is a tough one, but it's it's an important thing we have to do for people. So how do we make uh, excellence the norm uh, instead of the deviation in our organizations today? Where, where's the focus need to be? Well, it, it starts with the hiring process. And, you know, civil service has a different hiring process. Yeah. Um, you know, it's minimum standards. You have a high school education? Yeah. I was talking to a... Uh, a uh, fire chief yesterday who's working on his PhD. And he says, many of the people, uh, the EMS directors, directors in a fire department, when they deal with, many of them are PhDs and MDs. And we are sending over a representative from the fire service with a high school education. Yeah. He says, and it, it's, it's an embarrassment. So his focus is on higher education. I'm a big fan of higher education because I think in the educational world, you get diverse lines of thinking. Diverse lines of thinking. Everybody talks about diversity, but they're focusing on race and sex and transgender and gay and all those issues that I have no problem with. Mm -hmm. But I'm a big fan of diversity of thought. If everybody in the highest levels of your organization has the exact same experiences, you're going to be missing some. You want to know the most important thing I learned in law school? Is I never really went to law school. I sort of lied to you on that. I showed up. I showed up late and I left early and I sat in the back. <laughs> Who sits in the back row of night school? Pregnant women, nursing women, women with babies. They sit in the back because they got to leave when the baby starts crying. They got to leave when the baby needs to get the diaper change. They got to leave to feed the baby and all that stuff. So I sat in the back row with these pregnant women and they would grab an extra set of handouts for me and I would stay there. You know, and the second the instructor turned around, I'd leave and go back to work or whatever I was doing. I never really went. I graduated in the top half of the bottom 10% of my class. I was way down at the bottom. And these women were number one, two, three, four, and five in the class. Uh, they're writing law review. And I'm sitting there just as a motorcycle cop saying, she's married. She's got a full-time job. She's pregnant. She's raising a baby. And she's going to night school and she's doing this. If I'm ever hiring people, I'm going to hire nothing but women who went to night school. And when I started my company, Lexapol, and we started moving out of state and I needed a lawyer in every state, I hired nothing but women who went to night school. They bring an entirely different perspective into there. They've never worked an eight-hour day in their life. They wouldn't understand an eight-hour day. You know, it's always 24-7. And some of them still work for Lexable, and I'm proud to have hired these people because they do a dynamite job. How do we hire people? You want to live a long time? Not just length of life, but quality of life. Here's the 10 Fs for you. Family, faith, friends, food, fun, funds, fitness, function, freedom, and fulfillment. And depending on how long I want to talk on this, I can drill down a little bit. Family. Take care of your family. Number two. Faith. Have a faith. I don't care what your faith is, but believe in a higher power. Friends. You don't need a thousand friends. You need a couple friends that you can talk to when you've got problems. People who would do, do you right and take care of business. Uh, food. If your grandmother wouldn't recognize it, don't eat it. My father had a great rule. You want a beer? Have a beer. You want a steak? Have a steak. You want a piece of pie? Have a piece of pie. Just don't do it every day. Everything in moderation. And if your grandmother wouldn't recognize it, don't eat it. Family, faith, friends, food, fun. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. And this is guaranteed to upset somebody. But that's the nice thing about being old. I can say things. I know a lot of cops who have committed suicide. And maybe my, my sampling data is not as wide as it should be. 
I know a lot of cops who have committed suicide. None of them were happy people. None of them were the jokesters. None of them were the ones that always had the smile on their face. None of them, you know, they were half empty rather than half full. You know, enjoy life. It's so short. Enjoy life. Laugh every day. Have some fun. Family, faith, friends, food, fun. Funds. Funds. Everybody in public safety, and I know that's part of our viewing audience, those in private sector. If I was running a fire department, a police department, or any company, there would be a class on retirement planning when? Start of the career. And every year as part of the performance evaluation, there will be a video based on how many years you have on the job and how old you are, specific to your needs. Everybody in public safety needs to retire debt-free. If you choose to work post-retirement, that's up to you and good for you, sharing that knowledge you've learned. But no one should be forced to work. I understand divorce and I understand uh, excuse me, medical issues. I've been involved in enough of those in my legal career. But spend your money wisely. Please don't be stupid. You know, I go to cop parties. I go to cop parties and I take my car, which is a 30-year-old Mercedes-Benz. I've had it for 30 years. I bought it brand new in 1992. It's a 93, so it's not that old. Is that the oldest car in the parking lot? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, son. What is that? Hey, Mr. Graham. Pretty neat, isn't it? It's an F-450 platform, sir, but it's got the Velocity Raptor package on it with a Ringer's Lactate D5W attached through the McGarrett, turbocharged, supercharged. How much you pay for that? Oh, it's $1,400 a month on a lease. Were your parents cousins? My gosh. Holy moly, $1,400 <laughs> a month on a lease. If you did not know how to invest and just put it in the bank, it would double, you know, in seven years, eight years. Holy moly, spend your money wisely. Family, faith, friends, food, fun, funds, fitness. Keep yourself in shape. You don't have to be a bodybuilder, but just keep on moving. Function. Be doing something. Be doing something, preferably something you like doing. Uh, family, faith, friends, food, fun, fun, fitness, freedom. Function, freedom. Be grateful you live in a free country. Be grateful you live in a free country. You know, my daughter did her graduate work in Scotland and at St. Andrews University. Four years later, my son did his graduate work in Manila. And when we put him on an airplane in Manila, he said this, hey, dad, are you going to visit me in Manila as often as you went to Scotland to see Sarah? No, no. You know, but we went down to Manila to visit him once. He worked in the slums outside of Manila, Bonobo, San Mateo, Rizal province, utter poverty. Just poverty you would not believe. Open sewer channels. No hope. And very, very happy people. And they had nothing. We have people born in this country who think they're getting screwed. You know, I read something the other day. What percentage of the world's population can walk into a bathroom, get hot water, and take a shower and have a functioning toilet all in one location? It's about 5% of the world's population. You are so fortunate to be in the United States of America. If I was ever running this country, there'd be mandatory service at age 18. Get out of this country for two years, whether it's military or Peace Corps or some other volunteer organization. You know, go take a look at the rest of the world and be grateful you live in a country where you are free, where you're free, freedom. And thank our military every day for what they're doing to assure that freedom. Freedom is not free. We've got to continue to recognize we are one generation away from total disaster if we don't pay attention to this stuff. And finally, fulfillment, knowing that you're making that difference. And for the viewers who are in public safety, every day you get an opportunity to make a positive difference to somebody's life. Watching this right now are firefighters who have saved a baby, who have rescued somebody from a burning house. I've got a cop who arrested a serial rapist. If all you do in your career is arrest one serial rapist, if all you do in your career is save one baby from a burning building, you have made a difference in this world. You know, there's a lot of people who hate work. I owe, I owe, it's off to work I go. You know, they hate their work. Every day you've got the difference to make a difference in somebody's life and to increase the value of your dash. Be grateful you have that job in public safety and every day try to make a difference in somebody's life. Life is three thirds. First third, second third, third third. First third, learning. Second third, doing. Third third, enjoying. And first third, here's a rule for you. Never say no and talk to everybody. Those two things 
have made me indispensable. Sergeant Becker, you know why he liked me? Hey, Gordon, we don't have overtime for this, but can you help me out with this? Yes, sir. Gordon, can you get over to this grade school and do a safety talk for these first graders? Yes, sir. Gordon, we don't have a, can you go help with this mock trial? Yes, sir. Become indispensable. When something needs to get done, here's the person who will get it done for you. Here's the person who will get it done for you. And number two, talk to everyone. And these are both issues today. You don't talk to people. They got their little handhelds. They talk to people they know. Talk to the person who sits next to you on the airplane. The fellow sitting next to me on the way home last night from Houston where I changed planes at Mobile, he runs a marijuana delivery service. You know, do I want to talk to this guy? Yeah, absolutely. What's the greatest risk you face? The greatest risk we face is that banks don't recognize us yet. There's some federal issues with banks, so we deal in nothing but cash. And that makes us prone to this and prone to this and prone to this. Well, I learned quite a bit, you know, from this fellow last night. You never know who you're sitting next to. Yeah. You talk to people, it makes their day, it makes your day, and you'll learn something. Talk to everybody. I'm sorry I rambled on this stuff, Chief. No, I appreciate it, Gordon. It, you, you probably don't don't realize how many people that you've influenced and impacted in your in your talks throughout the years. I know in the fire and the police service has been immense, but I'm sure it's you know in the private sector as well. I mean, you've 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 made a difference in so many lives that I just don't know that you know you know how how much you've you're, impacted. You're very kind. It's it's humbling to have people tell me that. Thank you, Gordon. I appreciate, appreciate you so much. Um, and thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Chief, for everything you've done. To all of you in the voting, of, of the viewing audience, good luck, good health, goodbye. God bless you. God bless America. And please keep your soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guard personnel in your prayers tonight. Without them, right now, this nation would be in a much bigger mess. And let's go back and let's make excellence the norm, not the deviation. Thanks again, Chief. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Leadership Crucible podcast. If you have a story of adversity you'd like to share, we'd love to hear it. Visit us at theleadershipcruciblepodcast.com and join us next time as we continue to explore how to live lives of success and significance.